Hello and welcome to the Common Sense Gospel. I'm Danny Simmons. And I'm Kurt Norbert. And we are talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, specifically, we'll be looking at the crucifixion uh, and the practice of it. And then we'll briefly look at the Jews who were under Roman rule uh, during the time of Christ. And so beginning with this show, we're going to try something a little different and move through a series of studies that are all focused on the same major topic. For those of you who listen to the Common Sense Gospel regularly, you know that Kurt and I typically address one Bible topic at a time in each individual episode. We're going to do it a little differently this time. And we should also say as we begin this first episode that we've decided to set the trivia questions aside uh, just because the the nature and the depth of, of these studies uh, requires a tremendous amount of focus and really dedication to the subject at hand. And, and we want to give that the best attention that we can. So beginning today, we will present five consecutive episodes that look carefully and deeply into the greatest moment in all of human history and the events that surrounded that moment. As we move through this series, Kurt and I will focus on the time in which Jesus lived. That will include the relationship between Rome and the Jewish people, the role that the Roman government played in all of this, the many problems that Jesus was causing for the religious leaders in that day, the plans that they were making to be rid of him, and we will consider the history and the brutal reality of the crucifixion. In part one of this series, we will be looking at the crucifixion in a general sense, why and how it was used by different nations, how the methods of crucifixion were slowly changing to improve its effectiveness on the one being punished, and also on the people who witnessed it as it happened. There are numerous references to crucifixion in the historical writings of Herodotus. He and other historians credit the Persians with the first use of crucifixion. And honestly, it doesn't really matter which historical writer you are considering. All of them, all of them regarded crucifixion as atrocious and barbaric. Far and away the most awful means of execution known to man. You know, it's, I think it's important to to begin to look at crucifixion that way, uh, when we focus on the Gospels, where our focus ought to be, it's easy for us to just get lasered in on the Romans. Uh, they were all about crucifixion, and uh, we can kind of develop a perception that it was only a Roman thing, that the Romans invented it, they perfected it, uh, they loved to to use it on people, and that really is not the case. Uh, the Romans actually were a little bit late to the scene in the use of crucifixion. As you mentioned, uh, what historical records we do have of crucifixion seems to begin with the Romans, but they were certainly not the only ones who practiced it. No. Uh, the Persian Empire had a lot of influence in India, and India uh, practiced crucifixion. So did the Assyrians. Uh, the Scythians were another people who practiced it. Uh, it was surprising to me in my research that the Celts also practiced crucifixion. Mm. Carthage was well known for crucifying people. In fact, some uh, tend to put forth the idea that Rome got the idea or the practice of crucifixion from their inveterate enemies, the, the Carthaginians on, on the north coast of Africa. There's not a lot of evidence to support that, but either way, the Car Carthaginians were practicing it. The Romans picked it up probably in the early 200s BC. Uh, the earliest mention we have of the Romans practicing crucifixion comes from a Roman playwright by the name of Plautus, uh, who lived in the second half of the uh, third century BC, from 254 to, to 184. So that would be a, around the time, at, at least that we have a historical record, that the Romans picked up this, this form of execution and began practicing it. Uh, also notable is the, the Greeks wound up uh, adopting this style of execution also, yep. although they had some unique ways of practicing it. Uh, that we'll touch on. Um, so it, it, it wasn't just a Roman thing. Crucifixion was a, a widespread practice among the different empires. Uh, 
in the times before Jesus came. I think it's also uh, important to know that depending on who was practicing it, it could be carried out on different platforms. And by that I mean some used just a stake, a pole in the ground. Uh, the Greeks uniquely would uh, attach a bunch of boards together and make a flat panel and then use bent nails to essentially hook or, or staple the victim to these this panel. Mm. Uh, so that's how they practiced it. They, they didn't necessarily nail them through the wrists as we see the Romans and, and others practicing, but that's how the Greeks were doing it. They, they would have a bent nail and they might hammer it in under the person's forearm or wrist. Right. And then that they were trapped in that hook. And so mainly, maybe a little less painful than some of the other nations were practicing it, but not by much. Uh, and another way was that they would uh, uh, nail the individual, which was quite common actually, uh, to whatever platform they were using. Uh, they would often also uh, take a pole and attach a crossbeam to it. And that's what we see in the case of New Testament crucifixion. Mm -hmm. That's how the Romans tended to practice it. And the, the general practice was that the victim would carry the crossbeam, not dragging the whole cross, but just carrying the crossbeam to the execution site. Um, and so we see that, and we also see all kinds of different positions. Uh, sometimes crucifixion would be performed by uh, the person being upside down on whatever platform they were being crucified on. Sometimes they were at an angle. Uh, they could be tied. They could be hooked, as I mentioned, the Greeks. They'd be nailed. Or the normal practice was they would be, just be spread-eagled, heads up, uh, with their arms tied or nailed to the crossbeam. But in all of this, uh, the entire intent, and, and I just might mention a lot of my source material is from a little booklet called The Crucifixion by a German scholar by the name of Martin Hengel, who did a lot of research on this subject. And in looking at all of the different nations that practiced crucifixion and how they viewed it and what they used it for, uh, the intent was always to subject the victim to the utmost indignity that they could conceive of. Right. They were trying to torture and humiliate and vilify and lower this, this person, this victim, in the sight of the people as a deterrent to whatever it is they were punishing the per person for, whether it was cr a crime or rebellion or whatever. It, it was practiced as a deterrent. And so they tried to make it as hideous as possible so that people would see this and go, Ooh, I don't want that happening to me. And so it was viewed that way as such a hideous and humiliating uh, practice that we really don't have a lot of detailed accounts about this in history. In other words, writers telling us uh, here's a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure on what was being done with crucifixion because they, even though it was mentioned quite a bit, writers just didn't want to dwell on it. So we don't have a lot of information prior to the Roman times on details of crucifixion. Uh, most of it comes from mentions that historians of the time of the Roman Empire would, would make. But even then, they, they either spoke of it in negative terms or if there were any specifics, they would specify who it should be practiced on. But they, they tended to really want to, wanted to avoid dwelling on the subject. And so we, the most detailed account th that we get out of all the ancient writings are, interestingly enough, in the Gospels as crucifixion was applied to Jesus because it's important for us to know the details of what was going on involving Jesus. That's right. And if you're kind of wondering like, okay, well, why are we, why does it take five 
parts to get through this and, and to consider this as a series. It's for that very reason, as Kurt's given us some information about the background of crucifixion, how it came to be, who invented it, and then how it was developed, that it's important to where we're going because when we get to this place that we're ultimately headed to, uh, these men who are involved in this crucifixion, they were professionals. Uh, it is what they were called on by their government to do. And, and we'll look at it again at when the time is appropriate, but uh, these men took great pride in their work uh, to punish the one who had been accused or had already had a judgment passed on them. And, and, and they could do that. They could be proud of, of their role in persecuting or punishing those who rebelled against Roman rule because they've already been convicted. And so now it's just their job to punish them um, as, as greatly as they can. And, and so that that's why the background is important. Um, as you mentioned, the, the impalement, I, I found that the Assyrians used impalement as a means of executing mm -hmm. deserters, captured enemies, rebels, and the like. Uh, there were none more fierce than the Assyrians in their devotion to cruelty. Mm. A quote from a, one historian that I found says, The Assyrians were proud of the mass executions. They loved to impale their victims on large stakes. Such sights instilled terror and fear into the rest of the population. For the Assyrian kings, it was a showcase of their power. And, and so for the Assyrians, you mentioned, you know, being placed upon a stake. Um, it was driven, this is how the Assyrians did it, driven into the chest cavity under the ribs, the body still being in an upright position while the victim's weight caused the spike to protrude deeper and deeper into the cavity of the chest. Uh, it was a slow death and it was terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Greeks. It was adopted and further developed by them with the hooks, as you mentioned. It was frequently used by Alexander the Great. Uh, Curious Rufus wrote about Alexander's use of crucifixion in his writings that we read in Historia Alexandri. And he says, after the siege of Tyre was broken, 2,000 enemies hung, fixed on crosses over a vast stretch of shoreline. So that, that just typifies what you're saying. There was a purpose behind it. There was, it was to strike fear in those who were still alive to say, this man has power and his power is real. And it was also to quell or hush or eliminate any threat of all, at all of rebellion. And so when, when the Romans, when they came into power, as you mentioned, Kurt, they were also using crucifixion as a form of execution. But it's from the Romans that I learned we get the word crux, uh, mm -hmm. C-R-U-X, which is ultimately where we get our word crucifixion from. It's well known that the Greeks and the Romans did not use crucifixion on the freeborn or on their own citizens. The upper Roman classes of society referred to crucifixion as the slave's punishment. So again, you know, we, we want Jesus in the background of all of this as we think about it. The Roman classes of society referred to crucifixion as the slave's punishment. The Romans' abhorrence for crucifixion is typified by, by a line from Cicero where he says this, let the very name of the cross be far away, not only from the body of a Roman citizen, but even from his thoughts. Quintilian, a Roman educator and orator, found crucifixion to be an effective deterrent for crime and sedition, as well as a source of satisfaction to the victim of the crime. And so he advocated the erection of crosses at the busiest intersections of the city. He didn't get his way, but that's what he wanted to see happen. He wanted everyone to see what happens to someone who uh, victimizes Roman citizens. And it, it's interesting, you know, his note, the Quintilian, what he has to say about it is he says that it was a source of satisfaction to the victim of the actual crime. So if, if someone is mm. crucified for murder, let's say, then, then the family of the one who was murdered would, it's up to them, but they would probably want to attend and be there and watch him now suffer his own death publicly and in great shame. And it, it brought closure to them. Mm. And, and that's interesting too to me because of how much the religious elite fought against Jesus and tried so hard to find a way to get, just get rid of him. They were furious. They were losing their minds. And finally, you know, when this plan comes together and now they're using the Roman government, that they're in that moment that they were satisfied. This guy finally got 
what he has deserved the whole time. And so that's, you know, obviously crucifixion used in the most disgusting and abused possible way because those men were wrong and Jesus had done nothing wrong. But it helps us see that a little better, doesn't it? That someone who feels like the victim of a crime could watch this take place and, and say, okay, you know, we're even or, or whatever. And, and we recognize that today. Uh, when a criminal is being sentenced, it's usually the family is allowed in the court to make a statement. Um, and that allows them to express their grief. Now they can get this off their chest, how they feel about all of this, and try to impress on the criminal, here's the magnitude of what you've done. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting to look at Rome's attitude, as you mentioned, uh, toward crucifixion. Uh, reference to the slave's death, and, and I, I've got some interesting points, I think, that, that illustrate that. It could be used on a Roman citizen yes, uh, for such serious crimes as high treason or, or something like that. However, it was usually argued against and occurred only rarely for the, the upper classes of Rome. Um, it was really an unusual situation if a citizen or one of the upper classes in Rome was a victim of crucifixion. It was reserved for the lower class criminals in society, for, for barbarians, for rebels, and especially slaves. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see the, almost the schizophrenic attitude that Romans had toward crucifixion. <laughs> they didn't like it. I mean, what decent human could view that, that horrible type of death with any kind of, you know, positive attitude toward it. And yet they were quite willing to use it against those that they felt did deserve a, a, an ultimate punishment like that. Um, to illustrate the view that the Romans were hesitant about crucifixion and it, it, it occupied an unpleasant place in their thoughts, uh, there was a Greek historian uh, from about 200 B.C. down to 118 by the name of Polybius. He was a Greek individual, and he chronicled the, the rise of the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean world. And, of course, a lot of that involved the conflict between the Romans and the Carthaginians for dominance in, in the Mediterranean. He writes and says the, the Romans wondered at the Carthaginian practice of crucifying their military leaders, who might have been defeated in battle or were not submissive enough to the ruling authorities in Carthage. Maybe they were a little too willful. And so the Carthaginians wouldn't hesitate to crucify these people. And the Romans <laughs> kind of just sat back and going, what is that? Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and yet the Romans were quite willing to use it uh, in circumstances that threatened Rome. Most people, for example, are familiar with the story of Spartacus, the Roman gladiator who led a revolt uh, around 72 BC, uh, probably the greatest slave revolt in Roman history. It, it really sent panic into the Roman authorities and the Roman populace because it took place in southern Italy, began in the city of Capua. Um, but when Spartacus was finally defeated, this had caused such a, a, a deep fear and panic in the Roman population because about anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the population was slaves right. in Rome. Yep. And so here you had this slave rebellion and people just, it, it was an existential fear that they had of this. So when Spartacus was defeated, the Romans took 6,000 of the surviving uh, gladiator army and spread them on the Appian Way from the city of Capua, where the revolt started, up to Rome. That's about a, a distance of 120 miles. So you've got 6,000 individuals crucified along the Appian Way for 120 miles, 
that means if you were going down that that route, which still exists today, the Appian Way is still there, every 100 feet, roughly, you were seeing another individual crucified on a, on a cross. So they were intent on making an example of this. They, as we've both pointed out, they wanted to deter any thought of rising up against Rome in a rebellion. Uh, it got to the point where Tacitus, uh, one of the primary sources that we have today of Roman history, mm. in his uh, account called the Annals, he mentions a place called the Campus Esquilinus, which was a special place in Rome that was set apart with crosses already set up. And so if any slaves behaved in a way that threatened Rome or they rebelled against their masters or they did anything that was considered a crime in Rome, a cross was ready for them to go get nailed to right there in Rome and be made an example of. Wow. So you have this dichotomy. We don't like this practice. It's hideous to think about it. But man, we need to use it to keep order. And we are going to make an example of anybody who seeks to defy the Roman way. Um, another thing that's not often considered is that during, during the Jewish uh, revolt, the Roman-Jewish war that began in about 69 AD and lasted to 73 and involved the destruction of Jerusalem in 70, uh, the historian... Josephus at that time tells us that when Rome er, was besieging Jerusalem, when the city was cut off, upwards of 500 refugees a day were making it out of the city to try to find mercy uh, in the Roman camp. Well, the Roman general at this point, Titus, we're told was sympathetic toward their, toward their situation. He had, he had pity on the Jews but he had a problem. He couldn't just let 500 Jews a day go free and maybe form an army in his backfield or, or indicate to the, the people in Jerusalem that the Romans were being merciful in any, any way. But he also couldn't care for all of these people. He couldn't imprison them and guard them and feed them because, I mean, that's quite a population building up. So he let his soldiers decide what to do about these refugees, and they just decided, we'll crucify them all. And it got so bad that Josephus records for us that they finally ran out of room to put crosses up to crucify all these people. Mm. And in fact, they ran out of wood to make crosses. And they were crucified in every contorted position that Romans could think of because they wanted to make an example and try to intimidate the the Romans in the city or the Jews in the city. You need to surrender and stop fighting against us because if you don't, here's what's going to happen to you. Yeah, And we don't often connect crucifixion with the destruction of Rome or of, of Jerusalem in AD 70. And yet that's part of how terrible that siege was and how awful the conditions in Jerusalem were, that they would look over the wall and just see the fields covered with crucifixion victims. It, it was just a horrible thing. And just one final point that I have on this, you mentioned that flogging or scourging often accompanied uh, crucifixion. And if there was any mercy shown <laughs> by the Romans in the act of crucifixion, this might have been it because oftentimes this scourging was so severe that it would hasten the death to a degree of some of the victims. Mm -hmm. Now, it depended on, on how much they were actually flogged. The more severe the flogging, of course, the greater the injury and the sooner death would occur. And so they would measure this out. If they wanted the person to really suffer on the cross for an extended period the flogging might be relatively light, although still an awful thing to occur. But it just shows 
the, the utter suffering and degradation that a person was subjected to, it wasn't just the suffering on the cross. It was the things, the scourging and the suffering that preceded it and then culminated on the cross. So Rome's attitude in all this is, is it's kind of weird, actually. Uh, they didn't like it, but they saw the necessity for it. And they didn't hesitate to practice it to the nth degree on those they felt were deserving. Mm. Yeah, the, I you know, just as we've gone through this so far, I'm thinking, I, I guess in my own mind, I, I felt like there were probably thousands of people who had been crucified through the mm. through history, oh. but it's millions. And it's so separated from us today because we don't even worry about things like that. And yet this was a very real thing happening in society during Jesus time, which, which is why we're focusing on it. And so I, I want to just say a couple of things that some of this will be a bit repetitive. Um, many of us and those of you who are listening are familiar with uh, the reading through the gospels and the crucifixion. And so there'll be some connection here, but uh, that's not the purpose for me reading it. This is a um, historical record of crucifixion, the way that it was done. Uh, it is often said the Persians invented it, but the Romans perfected it. Uh, and in the days of Rome, this is how it was done. After the judgment, they always employed some form of torture prior to the crucifixion. This was nothing new. It had always been done this way. But the Romans called it the scourging, as Kurt had just pointed out. And it was done to the point of making blood flow. That was its purpose. Scourging was done with a whip or a cord of whips known as the cat of nine tails. Long strips of leather that had metal and bone shards placed inside of them in order to rip and tear the flesh away from the body. The Roman soldier would whip down across the back and then pull down and away from the body to make sure that those shards tore the flesh away. Um, and as you said, Roman soldiers had a lot of say in this. If they wanted to preserve the person and make them suffer on the cross, then they would lighten those lashes. Uh, they had full control. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of the scourge was the last attempt by the, by the nation of Rome to get a confession. You were beaten expecting to give names to the Romans of who else was involved in either your insurrection or robbery or murdering or whatever else you were accused of, that if there were other names, that was the time to give it. If you would give the names, then the lashes would be lightened. And that was the deal, often unspoken deal, between the Roman soldier and the one who was being beaten. The man would be laid over a large stone or tied to a post where he could not defend himself, tied down or tied up, and then beaten on his back. Some record of crucifixion scourging uh, notes the loss of um, organs, mm. um, exposure of the kidneys and the liver across the back and the lower back um, could, could be the case in some instances. Um, but again, all of it was done for a purpose, and these men were used to seeing it. Um, after the scourging, if the man survived, the victim of this act would carry his own crossbeam to the place of execution. As he drew near to the upright stake that had already been erected, the soldiers would lay the crossbeam on the ground and fasten, fasten him to it there lying on his back. Historical records tell us that he was usually fastened with ropes uh, and, by, and often by nails as well. The beam and the body were then lifted into place on the upright. Once the condemned was lifted up, he was left unable to attend bodily functions he was exposed to any type of inclement weather. Flies and other insects had free reign on his flesh. The body was often left to suffer under the most terrible death possible, and he would become prey to carry on birds and wild animals, sealing the utmost form of humiliation. It was not unusual for the criminal to have a tablet identifying his crimes to be hung on or above the condemned as he suffered the most agonizing death. And again, this is just a general, the way that it was done during the time of Roman rule. Yeah, well, you look at that, you, you were mentioning describing the scourging. Uh, 
It's just amazing to me that anyone could survive that. But as you said, the, the Roman soldiers and the executioners were very skilled uh, at their work. And so they knew how much punishment they could inflict on an individual while not making him pass out or go into a coma. He's still mobile because they'd make him carry his crossbeam. Uh, so they they were pretty precise. They knew how much punishment to inflict. Yeah. But there, again, it's all about pain and anguish. Uh, Humiliation. Just intense suffering. And then the crucifixion in a public place uh, was for the intent of displaying this individual that this person is a low-life criminal scum, not worthy of attention by society. And if you act like this person is alleged to have act, uh, acted, this is the treatment you're going to get. And I will point out, too, we, we often, the, the, the renditions and the pictures we see, for example, of Jesus' crucifixion are, are modestly uh, portrayed. That person was naked on the cross. And so that is more public humiliation. Oh, yeah. Uh, because they were, like I mentioned, the Appian Way. The crucifixion was performed in a public place where there'd be a lot of passers-by or where a crowd could gather. And so here you are looking at this individual, beaten, torn open, naked, uh, condemned by society, declared by the Roman government to be the lowest form of criminal that can exist in the society, and this is how that person's going to be treated. Yeah. Uh, and this this led to you know this this unusual attitude of the Romans toward crucifixion. It had its effect on relations between Jews and Romans too. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see that develop. Because of course there wasn't, there was no love lost between Romans and Jews, but they had to accommodate each other to an extent. Yeah, yeah, they did, and that's the other part of this. We've we've spent a good amount of time now talking about the crucifixion and and the history of that, and why it's present in the in the time that we will consider through these uh, five podcasts, but there's also in in the mix of all of this is the Jewish life under Roman rule. And so as the Roman Empire was spreading and growing in strength, really from the west and over into the east, um, that's when we see General Pompey enter Jerusalem in 63 BC. And it was during this time that the Romans established local kings who would be loyal to Rome. Now the Jewish people were subject not only to Caesar's whims, but also to the infighting of the local kings that were appointed by Rome and ultimately by Caesar. Uh, we know from the Gospel of Luke that there were two Caesars, individual Caesars, that reigned during the life of Christ. Luke 2 and verse 1 says, It came to pass in those days that a decree, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And so we know that Jesus was born under the rule of the Roman Emperor Augustus. He ruled from 30 B.C. to A.D. 14. And that after that, his adopted son, Tiberius, ruled from A.D. 14 to A.D. 37. Uh, these two men are both mentioned once in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 2 and verse 1 is where Augustus is mentioned. Luke 3 and verse 1 is where Tiberius is mentioned. But the point here from Luke is that in the time of Christ, the Jewish people were under Roman domination. Uh, Judea's king, being appointed by Caesar, was Herod the Great. He was installed as king of the Jews by the Roman Senate in 37 BC. Under Herod, the Jewish high priesthood was basically for sale to the highest bidder, and the Jews knew that even their temple in Jerusalem was corrupted. This was certainly a difficult time for the Jewish people, and it led most of them toward the Messianic hope. They were looking for the one they believed would come to free the Jewish people from Caesar, from their local king, and from their corrupt religious leaders. Rome's pagan religious system sharply conflicted with Judaism. 
And this conflict deeply affected Jewish life in the first century AD. It resulted ultimately in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and continued until the beginning of the second century when the Jewish people were banned from Judea. And so there's a lot of problems going on right now. And, and people are just trying to figure out how to, how to live their life. Yeah, and it, it's, there's a lot of tension uh, between the Romans and the Jews uh, as they both tried to accommodate some realities. Uh, a lot of politicking at the, the higher levels of society, like you mentioned. Uh, the puppet king, Jewish king, Herod, uh, would basically sell off the high priesthood. So here the, the Jewish religious authorities are kind of in collusion with Rome while at the same time hating Rome. Right. The Romans are trying to exert their authority as the occupying empire, and yet they're cutting the Jews as much slack as possible because... They're trying to keep them from a constant state of rebellion. And this was always a problem in, in Palestine, or the, the Roman name was Palestina. That's where we get that name, Palestine. Uh, but this was a powder keg in the Roman Empire. And so they, the Romans, in exerting their rule, tried to keep it as loose as possible to give the Jews some room. And, and they were always pushing back. Uh, and yet they both realized their limitations. The, the Jews could only go so far in enforcing their religious laws. Uh, and there was this conflict between the Roman idolatry and, and uh, the Jewish recognition of one true God. So just all of this tension and maneuvering and infighting, and you've got the Romans and the and their puppet king the Herods and you've got the Jewish authorities and Jewish society is split into three or four different factions of of those who are willing to go along with the Romans those who were willing to accommodate them and those who were I mean if they could stab a Roman soldier in the back in the middle of the street and and get away with it they'd do it uh, and these were called the Sicarii or the or the zealots that's the assassins. Right. Yep. So you had all of this stress in society because the Jews are now under the heel of an idolatrous and whom they considered barbaric conqueror, but still would claim that they're free. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> kind of weird. You read that in John uh, chapter 6, I believe it is, that, you know, We've never been under the under subjection to any man. Well, <laughs> wrong. For the last five hundred years, you've had outside empires yeah. ruling over Judea. Um, but here's and in top on top of that, as you mentioned, they knew from Daniel that we're in the time of the fourth empire now, and so our Messiah, the Anointed One, is going to come and deliver us. So there's this expectation in the air, and you. All of this is the is the fullness of time, I guess, is the best way to describe it. This is the societal environment that we find Jesus uh, entering into when he came at just the right time to fulfill God's will. Yeah, and it's, it's, you, you pointed everything out that I had basically in my notes was that you have three groups i think within the jewish people just to you know simply put it and, and you you listed all three but you've got the the higher level of society the jewish society that that they were given some level of power by caesar and by rome and so they they were comfortable with that power they they kind of liked the position that they were given and that that means all of the council the pharisees the sadducees all of them fit into that and they knew that they were given power because of anti Antipater, Antipater, I believe it is, mm -hmm. the father of Herod the Great, he helped Julius Caesar conquer Egypt. And so Caesar gave them, the Jews, legal status within the Roman Empire. And so they were enjoying that. Meanwhile, the common Jew, the average person of the day, as you said, understood what pro was prophesied in Daniel chapter 2, that Rome was the fourth reigning 
kingdom. And the next one would be the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus and John the Baptist step on the scene and they say, both of them say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're, they know what that means. <laughs> That's and the word, yeah. They are prepping for that very thing. So, so now we've got this larger group, but less powerful people. And then, as you mentioned again, the zealots, I, I had a lot of information on them. They, they were known to just carry blades with them. They were ready to shank anybody that was going to stop uh, the kingdom from coming into its power and to its position. Uh, they wanted to bring in the kingdom through violent resistance, basically. So for the most part, the Jewish people in Judea basically tried to live their obligations to God and to the state. Their cry as a nation was to die rather than to worship other gods. Their commitment to keeping the Mosaic law, honoring the Sabbath, and keeping their dietary restrictions were the main concerns of Jews in Judea during this time. Caesar gave them the right to keep the Sabbath, uh, to stay kosher. He gave them the right to meet regularly in synagogues, to decide their own affairs. And they could contribute money to their own causes and based on their own law. So the, those were freedoms they needed. And, and their, their success in maintaining those rights depended on their relationship with the local ruler, first of all, Herod, and then ultimately to Rome and to Caesar. In Judea, their success depended on the relationship between the Roman procurator and the designated Jewish authorities. And that was just the bottom line. And I think most people hated that. But that is where they were, and that was the life that they lived. And so they did the best they could with what they had. But as you said, this is nothing less than a powder keg. There's too many upset people. There's too many deep, deep, uh, generationally held convictions that are being opposed and fought against. And, and something has to give. And, and in all of this turmoil, uh, Jesus will be born into this to live his life as a man and, and to walk around and, and to serve others. It, it's, just, it's, it's just almost too much to, to take in, which is why it's so important that we give and offer this backdrop to the place where we will ultimately go. Yeah, and, and really behind it all, as we've mentioned, this is the fullness of time into which Jesus would come. So it's God behind the scenes here. Uh, Rome and, and Judea and the people are acting as free will agents. They're going to do what they're going to do. But God is using that to get things ready for the coming of his son. Uh, and it, there are just so many threads historically and societally and the rise and fall of empires and environments and viewpoints and uh, infrastructure. There's just so much that God was accomplishing over thousands and thousands of years to get things just right for yeah. the Savior to come, for the, the Messiah to appear according to the promise. Yeah, what an amazing thing. So for us, as we think about this now, we, we've got the crucifixion going on in the background. It's happening. People are crucified, certainly, during this day and age. There's also the common conversations on the streets. You know, Depending on who you're around or who you're with, you're either joking about what Herod may or may not do or how powerful Caesar truly is or whether or not God is first in your life. These are the conversations that are flowing in the city streets of Jerusalem. And again, Jesus is going to step onto the scene and ultimately... Um, from our viewpoint, looking back at all of these great events, the, the Jewish story of the first century A.D. was nothing less than a tragedy. God's people were looking for their deliverer, but when he came, they did not recognize him. It was only a matter of time before the civil relationship between the imperial Roman rule and the absolute monotheism of Judaism became untenable. After 70 A.D., the Jewish people became scattered around the empire still waiting for their Messiah. We know that when he comes again, being revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, that Israel and the whole world will recognize him. In the end, the God of Israel will reign while the gods of Rome and the rest of this world are scattered into dust. Please read Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 and see the prophetic message right there.